Great achievement is usually born of great sacrifice and is never the result of selfishness. Chapter 15 The Sixth Sense The Door to the Temple of Wisdom The Thirteenth Step Toward Riches The Thirteenth Principle is known as the Sixth Sense, through which infinite intelligence may and will communicate voluntarily without any effort from or demands by the individual. This principle is the apex of the philosophy of success. It can be assimilated, understood, and applied only by first mastering the other twelve principles. The sixth sense is that portion of the subconscious mind that has been referred to as the creative imagination. It has also been referred to as the receiving set through which ideas, plans, and thoughts flash into the mind. The flashes are sometimes called hunches or inspirations. The sixth sense defies description. It cannot be described to a person who has not mastered the other principles of this philosophy because such a person has no knowledge and no experience with which the sixth sense may be compared. After you have mastered the principles in this book, you will be prepared to accept as truth a statement that may otherwise be incredible to you. Through the sixth sense, you will be warned of impending dangers in time to avoid them and notified of opportunities in time to embrace them. As you develop your sixth sense, it is almost as though a guardian angel comes to you to be of help and assistance, a guardian angel who will open to you at all times the door to the Temple of Wisdom. Miracles of the Sixth Sense I am not a believer in, nor an advocate of, miracles, for the simple reason that I have enough knowledge of nature to understand that nature never deviates from her established laws. However, I believe that some of nature's laws are so incomprehensible that they produce what appear to be miracles. The sixth sense comes as near to being a miracle as anything I have ever experienced. This much I do know, that there is a power or a first cause, or an intelligence which permeates every atom of matter and embraces every unit of energy perceptible to man. I know that this infinite intelligence is the thing that converts acorns into oak trees, causes water to flow downhill in response to the law of gravity, follows night with day and winter with summer, each maintaining its proper place and relationship to the other. Through the philosophy explained in this book, this intelligence can help turn your desires into concrete or material form. I know this because I have experimented with it, and I have experienced it. Step by step through the preceding chapters, you have been led to this, the last principle. If you have mastered each of the preceding principles, you are now prepared to accept, without being skeptical, the extraordinary claims made here. If you have not mastered the other principles, you must do so before you may determine definitely whether or not the claims made in this chapter are fact or fiction. Let great people shape your life. I have never completely divested myself of the habit of hero worship. While I was passing through the stage of hero worship, I found myself trying to imitate those whom I most admired. My experience has taught me that the next best thing to being truly great is to emulate the great, to try to act like them, be like them, and feel like them as much as I could. I discovered that the faith with which I tried to imitate my idols gave me great capacity to do so quite successfully. Long before I had ever written a line for publication or delivered a speech in public, I followed the habit of reshaping my own character by trying to imitate the nine men whose lives and life works had been most impressive to me. These nine men were Emerson, Paine, Edison, Darwin, Lincoln, Burbank, Napoleon, Ford, and Carnegie. Every night, over a long period of years, I held an imaginary council meeting with this group whom I called my invisible counselors. This is how I did it. Just before going to sleep at night, I would shut my eyes and see, in my imagination, this group of men seated with me around my council table. 
Here I had not only an opportunity to sit among those whom I considered to be great, but I actually dominated the group by serving as the chairman. I had a very definite purpose in using my imagination in this way. My purpose was to rebuild my own character, so it would become a composite of the characters of my imaginary counselors. Realizing that I had to overcome the handicap of being born and raised in an environment of ignorance and superstition, I deliberately assigned myself the task of voluntary rebirth through the method I have described above. Building Character Through Autosuggestion I knew, of course, that we all become what we are because of our dominating thoughts and desires. I knew that every deeply seated desire causes a person to find a way to turn that desire into reality. I knew that self-suggestion is a powerful factor in building character. In fact, it is the sole principle through which character is built. With this knowledge of how the mind works, I was fairly well armed with the equipment needed to rebuild my character. In these imaginary council meetings, I called on my cabinet members for the knowledge I wished each to contribute. I would even speak out loud to each of them as follows. Mr. Emerson, I desire to acquire from you the marvelous understanding of nature which distinguished your life. I ask that you impress upon my subconscious mind those qualities you possessed that enabled you to understand and adapt yourself to the laws of nature. Mr. Burbank, I request that you pass on to me the knowledge that enabled you to so harmonize the laws of nature that you caused the cactus to shed its thorns and become an edible food. Give me access to the knowledge that enabled you to make two blades of grass grow where but one grew before. Napoleon, I desire to acquire from you the marvelous ability you possess to inspire men and will rouse them to greater and more determined spirit of action. I desire also to acquire the spirit of enduring faith which enabled you to turn defeat into victory and to surmount staggering obstacles. Mr. Payne, I desire to acquire from you the freedom of thought and the courage and clarity with which to express convictions which so distinguished you. Mr. Darwin, I wish to acquire from you the marvelous patience and ability to study cause and effect without bias or prejudice so exemplified by you in the field of natural science. Mr. Lincoln, I desire to build into my own character the keen sense of justice, the untiring spirit of patience, the sense of humor, the human understanding, and the tolerance that were your distinguishing characteristics. Mr. Carnegie, I wish to acquire a thorough understanding of the principles of organized effort which you use so effectively in the building of a great industrial enterprise. Mr. Ford, I wish to acquire your spirit of persistence, the determination, poise, and self-confidence that have enabled you to master poverty and to organize, unify, and simplify human effort so I may help others to follow in your footsteps. Mr. Edison, I wish to acquire from you the marvelous spirit of faith with which you have uncovered so many of nature's secrets, the spirit of unremitting toil with which you have so often wrested victory from defeat. The Startling Power of Imagination My method of addressing the members of my imaginary cabinet would vary according to the traits of character I was most interested in acquiring. I studied the records of their lives with painstaking care. After some months of this nightly procedure, I was astounded as each time my imaginary counselors started to become more and more real to me. Each of these nine men developed individual characteristics that surprised me. For example, Lincoln developed the habit of always being late, then walking around in solemn parade. He always wore an expression of seriousness on his face. Rarely did I see him smile. This was not true of the others. Burbank and Payne often indulged in witty repartee, which seemed at times to shock the other members of the cabinet. On one occasion, Burbank was late. When he came, he was excited with enthusiasm and explained that he had been late 
because of an experiment he was making, through which he hoped to be able to grow apples on any sort of tree. Payne chided him by reminding him that it was an apple that started all the trouble between man and woman. Darwin chuckled as he suggested that Payne should watch out for little serpents when he went into the forest to gather apples, as they had the habit of growing into big snakes. Emerson observed, No serpents, no apples. And Napoleon remarked, No apples, no state. These meetings became so realistic that I became fearful of their consequences and discontinued them for several months. The experiences were so uncanny, I was afraid that if I continued them, I would lose sight of the fact that the meetings were purely experiences of my imagination. In writing this book, this is the first time that I've had the courage to mention this. I knew from my own attitude in connection with such matters that I would be misunderstood if I described my unusual experience. I now have the courage to put this on the printed page, because I am now less concerned about what they say than I was in the years that have passed. While the members of my cabinet may be purely fictional, and the meetings existed only in my own imagination, they have led me into glorious paths of adventure, rekindled my appreciation of true greatness, encouraged my creativity, and inspired me to be honest and bold in expressing my thoughts. Editor's Comments Napoleon Hill's experience with his imaginary counselors is not as uncommon as it may seem on first reading. In fact, it happens to novelists all the time. As an author proceeds with the writing of a book, there will come a point when the characters in the novel become so well defined in the author's mind that the personalities of the characters themselves begin to suggest plot points and dialogue that the author never planned. Often the thoughts that come to the author when he or she is in the character are completely original and in real life would never have occurred to the author. Psychiatrists, therapists, and motivational experts also use this phenomenon when they work with role-playing. The usual procedure is to ask two people to act out a scenario as if they were in each other's shoes. If this is done in a situation where the participants do not feel embarrassed or self-conscious, and if the people will allow themselves to become submerged and seriously try to become the other person, the results can be stunning. Depending on the faith with which you approach it, you can get not just a general sense of what the other person is going through, but also have flashes of insight, actually feel what the other person feels, and gain a real understanding about the reactions or motivations of others. Why it works is just as much a mystery as why you get hunches. It may be simply that when your imagination creates a character, it doesn't give the character inhibitions so when you think through the character, your mind is less restricted. Regardless, the fact is that by using your imagination to project yourself into other characters, you can open yourself to ideas that you don't normally have access to, and you can use this mental phenomenon as one of the tools that will help you turn your desire into success. This is the end of the editor's comments. Tapping the Source of Inspiration Somewhere in the cell structure of the brain is something that receives the vibrations of thought ordinarily called hunches. So far, science has not discovered where this sixth sense is located, but this is not important. The fact remains that human beings do receive accurate knowledge through sources other than the physical senses. Generally, such knowledge is received when the mind is under the influence of extraordinary stimulation. Any emergency that arouses the emotions and causes the heart to beat more rapidly may bring the sixth sense into action. Anyone who has experienced a near accident while driving knows that the sixth sense often comes to your rescue and by split seconds helps to avoid the accident. I mention this as background to the following statement of fact. On many occasions when I have faced emergencies, some of them so grave that my life was in jeopardy, I have been miraculously guided past these difficulties through the influence of my invisible counselors. My original purpose in conducting council meetings with imaginary beings 
was solely to use auto-suggestion to impress upon my subconscious mind certain characteristics that I wanted to acquire. In more recent years, my experimentation has taken on an entirely different trend. I now go to my imaginary counselors with every difficult problem that confronts me and my clients. During my meetings with these invisible counselors, I find my mind most receptive to ideas, thoughts, and knowledge that reach me through the sixth sense. The results are often astonishing, although I do not depend entirely on this form of counsel. The sixth sense is not something that one can take off and put on at will. Ability to use this great power comes slowly through application of the other principles outlined in this book. No matter who you are or what may have been your purpose in reading this book, you can profit by it even if you don't fully understand how or why the principle described in this chapter works. This is especially true if your major purpose is that of accumulation of money or other material things. This chapter on the sixth sense was written because the book is designed to present a complete philosophy by which individuals may unerringly guide themselves in attaining whatever they ask of life. The starting point of all achievement is desire. The finishing point is the kind of knowledge that leads to understanding. Understanding of yourself, understanding of others, understanding of the laws of nature, and the recognition and understanding of happiness. Full understanding of this comes only through familiarity with, and use of, the principle of the sixth sense. In reading this chapter, you may have found yourself lifted to a high level of mental stimulation. Splendid! Come back to this again a month from now, read it once more, and observe that your mind will soar to a still higher level of stimulation. Repeat this experience from time to time, giving no concern as to how much or how little you learn at the time. Eventually, you will find yourself in possession of a power that will enable you to throw off discouragement, master fear, overcome procrastination, and draw freely upon your imagination. Then you will have felt the touch of that unknown something that has been the moving spirit of every truly great thinker, leader, artist, musician, writer, or statesman. Then you will be in a position to transmute your desires into their physical or financial counterpart as easily as you may lie down and quit at the first sign of opposition.